And to talk you through what I mean, most people are scared to go all in on something. Scotty, you're the side hustle coach. I am now in my spare time, the community building guy. We have conviction in what we're doing and that inherently makes us more referable. It was so, scary too, though. I don't want it to make anybody right? seem like you knew how weird and nervous and fearful I was full of doubt. And some days I still deal with that, but yeah, it, it was great. It's not supposed I, to be easy. No, it's not. And guess what? Before you might've occasionally talked about side hustling, but it wasn't Strictly your whole jam. Because people would ask me questions on how to do it, you know? <laughs> right. And people don't refer people that do that. So I've seen, there's a lot of people, they might write a book on community, but they wrote 20 other books. Or they do a one podcast on community, but they've got 200 other podcasts. So who's going to be like, oh yeah, they're the community guy or girl. Like they won't. It's just like part of what they're doing. They're flirting with it. They're not committed. Whereas when you're all about that thing, that's when people are like, yeah, you, oh, you want to learn about side hustles. Cool. And I've done that with you. That Literally I've done it. My where business was not flirting and going all in and owning it. That yeah. exploded everything. Yeah. You're not flirting. You're proposing. You're getting married. <laughs> what it's all about so um yeah really it's quality and conviction the perspective podcast is fuel for your mind and creative grind each week we break down the art of healthy hustling overcoming the inner critic and growing your creative business PC family, we welcome back Tom Ross on the show today for like what, round 732 and a half. I actually think technically it's maybe round three for a solo episode, but it's been too long. How have you been, dude? I miss you. It's good to be back. Thanks for having me on, man. And yeah, yeah I'm great. Too. I'm great. You've been living under a rock, grinding in silence, which is kind of what we're going to be talking about today. But whenever you and I get together, like people better come prepared to take some notes and to just like feel all the good things and feel all the warm and fuzzies and follow it up with massive action. Like that's what I want people to do today. And I can assume you feel the same. Action's going to be the word, you know, like to keep it practical. So uh, my biggest worry for today is how much I want to try and pack into like 45 minutes. But if people want more, we have a good step for them for free if you want to go deeper down the rabbit hole of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so if you want to know more about Tom, just go back. Episode 119, February 2019. Episode 156 in January 2020. And then last July 2020, you and Mike Janda were on um, episode 176 for a bid, uh, Biz Buds feature. So mm -hmm. yeah, you are a regular on this show. So this is number four, technically. I appreciate um, it, man. But for those who may not know about you, go back to the old episodes. Just give us a brief Wikipedia page, elevator pitch about yourself. Yeah, sure. So I've been doing this since I was 12 years old. I'm 33 now. I think we're the same age, right, Scotty? July 31st, I turned 33. Yeah. So here in a couple Damn. months. Yeah, I just turned 33. So I've been doing this, you know, over 20 years now. I've never had a traditional nine to five. I've just been dabbling in the online thing, had all kinds of projects over the years. Eight years ago, I started my company Design Cuts, which is the highest rated marketplace for creatives. And I'm so passionate about community that that is my side hustle. So I'm such a geek about it. In my limited spare time, I just help teach community. I do a bunch of podcasts. I help as many fellow entrepreneurs as I can because, because I love it. That's the truth. I love this stuff. I could talk about it forever. I get to have cool conversations with people like you, Scotty. So that's me. And I think that's why you're, that we hit it off within like two seconds of us linking up because I feel we're so aligned I think we've both done things the wrong way in the past. We've burned out. We've burned ourselves. We've hurt relationships. And we were just chasing the wrong carrot, I think, for the wrong mm -hmm. reasons early on. And I think what we're focused on today is helping people bypass those hurdles to go deeper. Because at the end of the day, truly, it is about community. Community changed the game for me. Like this podcast, is, I would not be here doing my thing full time and loving life, being fulfilled with my creative dream had it not been for community. Yeah, agreed. And me neither. And I can get into that in this episode, but it's been a complete paradigm shift, game changer. It is, right? It changes everything. And the and it before is it... not pretty, like where you're trying to figure it out and you're getting sucked into like all the sleazy crap that people are teaching. And then you're like, oh, actually, I just need 
an incredible tribe of people that actually care about me and I care about them and that's rewarding and fun and it's good business. Like everyone wins. Yeah. And I would say, uh, sleazy marketing. We're not into marketing changed the game for me is flipping on the marketing switch and getting around someone like you who is a marketing guru. But, but for me, it's like relationship marketing. That's what it's all about. You know, go people going deeper people. Yeah. People's the game. It's compounding impact one person at a time over time is how you create an engaged community that gives a shit about not only your work, but the human who creates it. And I think that's what we're chasing and helping other people uh, tap into as well. So why have you been living under a rock over the past three months? I've been living under a rock because I've been writing my first book, which is just out, but it is all about community. And truthfully, I've been writing this book in my head for about seven years. I was going to go down the publisher route and maybe I will in the future. But I talked to our mutual friend, Mike Janda. We did a whole podcast on what it's like to get a book published. And he was like, oh, basically I had to like ignore my company for six months, work with editors on endless revisions and go through all the logistics of publishing. And I was like, okay, I do not have time for that, but I don't want to wait any longer because this book is bursting out of me. So I was like, screw it. I'm just going to put it out in digital format And then uh, kind of true to my style, I put it out for free because I genuinely want this to help a ton of people. Um, And yeah, the feedback has been very humbling. I have to say like, it it was literally at the time of recording, it it was a few days ago, like three days ago, I released it and thousands of people have downloaded this thing already, which is mind blowing to me. Well, and I think that's the power of community when you show up and serve people instead of just constantly. So like, dude, we got to sell to survive. Okay. Like me, I would say 80% yeah. of the time I'm giving away free information. The other 20% I'm selling to put food on my table and keep a mortgage going. So like you got to sell, but at the same time, I feel like we're givers at the end of the day and we know that it'll come back to us in the end. Yeah. I mean, do both. Like you, you sell to the portion of your audience that want what it is you're offering. And if that's 5% and then 95% get incredible stuff for free. Again, everyone wins. Mm-hmm. No one's like forcing anyone to buy. And you look at some of the biggest innovators and disruptors in our space. Like I talk to Christo pretty often from the future. How they win with their community is they give more than just about anyone. Give, give, give all the time. But you better believe they sell and they have incredible courses and stuff like that as well. So yeah, both. There's levels I'm to totally it. a believer. Mm-hmm. I feel like at the end of the day, it's let's give, give more than you take and things will always come back and play in your favor, you know, and people will rally around you and support you. So with that book today, like we're not giving you a sales pitch to go buy some shit. Like, dude, we're going to rip out some super valuable nuggets, go deep. Like, I'm just going to let Tom just slay it and melt your brains with value. If you're stuck right now, feeling like freelance is the only way. Well, like, no, let me tell you about how building a community can powerfully change your creative pursuits, your side hustle, make you pandemic proof. Like it helped me last year. So um, with that being said, do you want to just take the wheels and um, dive deep? I'll add my two cents here when I feel it's needed or wanted. Yeah, or man. I, I mean, like I have to talk. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm super happy for it to be a conversation because I might need you to steer me because there is so much like so, so much to cover, but you know, I can start with some of the f- fundamentals and the foundational stuff that might yeah, be yeah. Let's uh, talk about a logical just starting point, the essence of your book. And then let's just like rip some really important takeaways from it. And if people want more, they know where to get it. Cool. So the book is pretty much everything I know on community building, which has taken like 15 years of trial and error and experimentation to figure out consolidated and compacted into a book. That's I think 175 pages And then within that, my whole style is make it actionable. I really hate when people are like headline scanners. So there's a lot of people being like, bring value, be authentic. And it's like, well, that's technically correct advice, but freaking how? Yeah, here's the why and the what, but here is a $700 (laughs) course with upcharges to get the how. Yeah, and that bugs me. So, um, you know, I I wanted it to be very tactical. And the ways I did that were I went very in-depth, but then there's like, actual exercises in the book and frameworks where you run stuff through. So that's kind of interactive in that capacity. And then for me, the best way I learn is seeing how other people have done it. So there's actually 30 plus case studies from real life community builders. And this is this includes Scotty, because he's awesome. And I couldn't leave him out of the book, right the way up to people I've connected with running literally billion dollar companies. 
So I, I have like, you know, the co-founder of Social Chain, the fastest growing social agency ever in Europe, um, or the, the chief brand officer of Gymshark, who's an insanely nice guy. And what's interesting is the rules are the same with companies and people that care about community. There's people who are like seeing early success and doing some cool disruptive stuff. And then there's the billion dollar brands. And basically the rules are the same how you do this stuff. It's, it's, you know, people. And, and I started to see all these patterns emerge. And what was interesting was I wrote this comprehensive book and I broke down like every step and broke it into sections and organized it. Then I went and did all the case studies. And it basically was the case that every case study and every detail of what they told me, I was like, oh yeah, that's chapter four. Like, oh yeah, that's page 114, which made me feel very confident that I had kind of covered it there was very little that was like completely new to me. But again, it's so insightful for me to learn from people exactly how they did it. Because then you take the tactics and when you see someone else apply them, that for me is incredibly inspiring. And I remember that from the early days of being an entrepreneur. Whenever I did a course, I was like, okay, I get the principles, but go and show me 10 different businesses that applied them because that's how it's going to really seep into my brain. Definitely. Do the same. Yeah, 100%. And I think it's like seeing what works for other people, what aligns with it, and then how can you make it work for yourself in your own unique way, your own spirit, yeah. your own secret sauce and everything. So um, what's kind of like one of the main top things you want to pull that you think would really hit home and strike a nerve with people? All right. So like I say, let's start with the foundational stuff. And I will give you a, you know a few kind of headlines here, but then we can absolutely discuss deeper. So... You need to get the foundation right. I think all too many people, they're just kind of putting out whatever they feel like on social media or whatever, and they're trying to respond to what works and what doesn't, and they don't really know where they're going. And I'm a huge fan of you know trying to actually get a plan in place. It doesn't mean you need to sit there and pontificate for months, but actually kind of thinking through what you're trying to build, who you're trying to serve, some of these fundamentals. Intention intention right and you know this is true for businesses businesses have business plans i think communities need community plans and even like a social media profile needs a plan and so when you look at some of those fundamentals what are they it's something you're passionate about and i see this time and time again and there's all kinds of frameworks like icky guy and stuff like that but fundamentally community is a ton of work so much work. You're in the trenches every day. You're having conversations at scale about this. You're talking to endless people about whatever your chosen community topic is. If you don't freaking love it and you can talk people's face off forever, you are going to burn out. You're going to lose interest. It's so, so imperative. And I've seen so many of my coaching students where I'm kind of coaching them on something and I can tell something's not clicking and then they just pivot the topic and it's like the thing they care about most in the world and they could just run on empty like forever, it seems. So you have to get that piece. And that is like the age old question, right? What are we passionate about? But I think there are things we can do and, and we can tune into that and we can, we can really lean into that. On the back of that, you need to think, well, who am I going to serve? So Scotty, what's something you're super passionate about? And I don't mean what you do for business now, like some esoteric hobby or something like that. Fitness. Yeah. All right. That's Gym Shark. When you said Gym Shark, my eyes lit up. I'm like, yes, those are the shorts I'm wearing today at the gym. Oh, no way. I'm part of the um, Gym Shark community. I want to be a part of that status. Okay. I promise we didn't actually plan this, but there is a case study in the book when it comes to fitness. So I'm going to break that down for you. Okay. Um, I'm, this is not planned. And I haven't even read this. I only read my part yet, selfishly. <laughs> yeah. So um, first of all, I'm going to give you the four frameworks. And then I'm going to share this case study. So the four frameworks of who you want to cater to as a community. Number one, do you like them? Because again, you are going to burn out if you don't love the people you're serving. You need to get on with them, right? You need to enjoy their company because you're going to be having a lot of conversations with these people. Number two, do you understand them? You need to deploy a lot of empathy. You need to really understand what they're going through, their likes, dislikes, what they care about, what they aspire to, that's going to help you create incredible content and serve them better. Number three, are you credible to them? Do they trust you? Do they like you? Do they believe in what you're saying, believe in your vision and your mission? And number four, and this is really freaking important, can they pay you? Because I have a case study in the book and I've got so many in my past where we tried to do a website for unsigned bands 
and we were ticking the first three, we were an unsigned band ourselves. We got these people, et cetera, et cetera. But when it came to, could they pay us? It's like, hell no. Unsigned bands have zero money. They had literally no budget. It would have been like impossible to monetize that audience from the bands themselves at least. And so you're setting yourself up for failure if you don't think these things through and kind of check all the boxes. And so with this, um, as, as I say, I've got a little framework here as well to understand demand. And so you kind of- This was called, just yep. so I can regurgitate in the show notes, this is the four question framework for- Yeah, so this is really defining your audience. Defining or finding? Yeah, defining. So defining your audience, you need okay. to tick these, uh, these four pieces. Cool. And then what you need to do, so by this point, it's like, you know, you've tuned into your passion- you've got a topic fitness, Scotty, you're then looking at the audience and it's like, well, do you like people in the fitness world? I'm guessing so. Do you understand them? Hell yeah. Cause you're there yourself. Are you credible to them? Well, yeah. Cause you're a freaking tank and like, you know, your stuff, right? You've been doing this for years and can they pay you? Well, arguably. Yeah. Maybe not all of them, but there's a lot of people in fitness who people are affluent really enough to invest. Or willing to exactly. Right. And this leads me perfectly to the next point. So demand you need to think about the demand for a community. And demand is really comprised or a combination of three things. You've got the market size. How big is the market you're trying to serve? And in the case of fitness, it's freaking huge, right? Massive. I don't know how many people are like into fitness, but hundreds of millions, maybe? Like a bunch. Easily. Easily. So then you've got competition. Is there a need for a, another community like this? Is this audience, this market, overserved or underserved? And if it's really overserved, obviously it's going to be tougher. If it's underserved, it's going to be easier to break through. And then finally, passion. And I would say, like, fitness is actually not a not a bad one because some people are like very passionate, or you know, they're desperate to lose weight, they're desperate to build muscle, whatever it might be. Like, you know, some people are super into fitness. There's some people in those hundreds of million or billions that may be more apathetic, but there's definitely a kind of passionate subset. And so I got this exercise in the book where it walks you through how to calculate or predict demand for your community. And in it, I argue that actually, if you're doing a generic fitness community, it's incredibly hard to break through in 2021 because it's so like, overserved. Hey, I want to appeal to all men, all women, all ages, or all genders, whatever, general neutral, uh -huh. and yep. all fitness scenarios, dreams, goals, desires, as opposed to like, I want to work with dads who want to be fit and want to lift weights, yada, yada, like specificity. Yeah. yeah, or maybe like dads who don't care about looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but they want to be able to pick up their kid and, and not have their back hurt. And have so the energy like to fitness. track them around at the end of the day or something like that. Yeah, yeah. right? So it's like dad fitness. <laughs> that that would be an interesting niche or community. And, and Bard's the dad fit. <laughs> yeah, right? And, and you know, that's such a great example. And that's going to make your life so much easier when you think in these terms of like niching and properly defining and looking at the demand of what's over and underserved. Because if you're just trying to be another generic fitness influencer, you're going to struggle because that is everyone on Instagram, right? Oh, I'm here like with my shirt off. It's like, okay, you and a billion other dudes. Yeah. What's different? And so the community that I call out, and I love this, it's one of my favorite case studies. It's called nerdfitness.com. You ever heard of this? Yeah. Yeah. I think I've read it from your niching guide in the past. Oh, cool. Okay. So nerd fitness is such a great example because they conflated the two markets. They basically got people into fitness and then nerds. And they talk about like, if you're a nerd, but you love deadlifting, this is the place for you. And literally these are people that love like Comic-Con and they're dressing up like Captain America and all kinds of stuff, but they're getting freaking pumped in the gym. And what this means is they actually, I worked it out, they have zero competition. I could not find a competitor that's doing what they're doing. So you're going from like everyone competing with you to no one, but they still got a potential audience of like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And people are so passionate, even more than like a general fitness lover, because they're like, oh my God, like, you know, I found my people. Like, I don't feel alienated or ostracized in the gym or whatever, because they don't identify as a typical gym bro or whatever it might be. So me, that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're an intimidating, intimidating guy, Scotty. I'm a so, 
<laughs> but like, I love that example. And, and that is such a good example of community because it's very much like I found my safe haven. I found my home, my private bubble where I can be myself and get the sense of belonging and all of those things, you know, I really break down in the book, but like a sense of belonging is freaking huge. It really matters. Safe space. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. So you can kind of see why I started with this and I know, you know, I've come on before and talked about niching. Um, that features a bit at the start of this book, but the reason it's so important is because if you screw that up, you make your life harder with everything that follows. Like we're going to dig in, in this episode, like how do you grow a community? How do you create true fans? How do you nurture your people? All that good stuff, but you're giving yourself an impossible battle if you're trying to compete in a market where you're finished before you've even started or where worst yet, there's simply no demand. Maybe you pick the topic that you care about and no one else gives a crap, which is pretty rare in this day and age. There's all kinds of esoteric random communities that have diehard fans, but you see my point, right? By actually surmising the demand and it doesn't mean you need to go do some random thing you don't care about just to cater to demand, but like little pivots and adjustments and repositioning of your brand could mean the difference between like breakout success or eternal struggle. And and I would want to make an important note to anybody who's like new in their creative groove, who's feeling overwhelmed, like they have to have this all figured out over time. I was just, for example, until I started figuring out all of these things and the marketing switches and figuring out who I'm serving, I was probably like four or five years into doing my thing as a side hustle until all these little switches started clicking. So yeah. please what we're doing here is to help you just be more intentional in the meantime, still experiment, but there's levels of the niche and you don't have to like have it all figured out in the first six months, you mm -hmm. know, little stretches of experimentation of things. But instead of just trying to do everything all at once, like go in little sprints of different things until you find something, you know, that you're yeah, really, really I passionate about and that you're really good at that sweet spot. And over time you'll start developing or seeing or sensing where's the demand a solution or a unique solution or value you could provide. So I don't want people to yeah. feel like super overwhelmed that they're like, Oh my God, I got to have all everything Tom figured out overnight. And I'm just new to this. Like, you don't, it took you me don't. years to figure this out. And once you do figure it out, Oh man, yeah. you're setting yourself but up for big things to happen. Just being intentional, as you say, rather than ignoring it or suppressing it or never thinking about it is a good idea. Hobbyists aren't intentional. Professionals are intentional. Even if you're just like new to the game and you're hustling outside of a day job, you can still be a professional and be intentional about what you're doing. I think yeah, that's what the main 100%. core of what we're saying is be intentional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So um, next point, I want to quickly touch on um, platforms because these really matter as well. And the basic premise is you want to pick a platform that you're passionate to use, but also where your people naturally are spending time that's the best kind. And in the book, I give the example with gamers of it would be smart to start a gaming community on Twitch or Discord, because that's literally where gamers live. If you're trying to force them onto a Facebook group, they're probably not going to want to hang on, hang out there. So again, the reason this is so important is it sounds like common sense, but the number of people I see who are trying to like shoehorn people into something that doesn't fit them or where they're not naturally spending time, again, you're kind of like finished before you've even started. And the same thing on the passion side, you need to do something that suits you. So my friend Dan like built this gigantic community of 50 people in his clubhouse club because he loves to talk. That's a good play for him. Whereas stuff like Instagram doesn't come as naturally. And so again, the sheer work it takes to actually build a community platform, you're not going to do it if it's not really something you enjoy. If you're more about chatting and writing, pick a platform appropriate to that. If it conflates with you know where your members are, if you're audio based, pick that. If you're video based, you know do live webinars and live events like we do at my company, Design Cuts. Like you have to pick something that's true to you. Cater and then to your with, strengths. Yeah, cater to your strengths. Go where the people are. And again, this sounds like common sense, but it's amazing how many people skim over it, just gloss over it, and never think about it, and then they get frustrated. Why is it not working? Why am I getting no traction? It's like the fundamentals matter. So. Once you pick the platform, you need to think about the value prop. So I'm going to hit you with four value propositions for your community. This should answer the question, which is so essential building community. Why are people going to show up? Why are people going to come to your community? So number one is networking. Quite simply, are they going to connect with like-minded people? Are they going to have opportunities arise in moments of ser serendipity? 
come up from the other people in the community. Opportunities arise from that. Number two is information. So is it a community predicated on teaching? When they're inside your community, they're going to learn stuff from you and other community members and community leaders and so on. Number three is belonging. And this is really powerful. Just feeling part of that group, part of that tribe goes a long way. And you look at so many successful communities, often this is cited as the most emotively charged and powerful reason for being in a community. And here's a, here's a weird example for you, Scotty. Religion, right? You go to the mosque once a week or you go to church once a week and you meet your group of people. Like that's powerful. That's a community. But arguably you get the same kind of sense of community and belonging if you're a freaking Trekkie <clears throat> and you're going to Star Trek conventions. And again, <laughs> yeah, try to do the finger thing. <laughs> Ooh, I'm impressed. Now try doing that. I have Super a hard, hard time. My wife and my <laughs> son can do weird things with their fingers and I just limit yeah, it. Yeah, so my fiance is the same. Alien Weirdos. looking hands. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> Please digress. But yeah, that um, that sense of belonging, it's super powerful. And again, it's that idea of like, oh, I finally found my people. I found my safe space and I feel like I'm one of them. And that's funny enough, that's how I felt when I, when I went to Creative South. It's exactly how I, thought, I felt when I went to Creative right? South or Crop Conference where I'm wearing on this t-shirt. Nice. I want to recreate yeah. that feeling for people who do coaching with me or are part of my communities. That's that's it. Because I felt isolated. It's that's powerful. what I needed. So yeah, that's like most people... Create don't give a crap let alone understand what we do like half of my family don't right yeah, but no way my, my family understands what the hell i'm doing i'm just the dude who doodles mm. and i'm like yeah okay. <laughs> yeah whereas like you and i like i could talk to you forever about this stuff like i love it right we're so passionate so when i went to creative south i made 200 friends more easily than i ever had in my life because everyone was on 200. a yeah like on oh, a level more. i was running around drinking margaritas like hey i don't know you like it came so easy i didn't have that you know, innate awkwardness we all have in a new group. I don't know anyone. I can't approach anyone. It just came much easier. So sense of belonging really matters. And then the final one, entertainment. Uh, is it a cool, fun place to be? Like, are they going to get, you know, humor and have a good time? Like, are they going to get a sense of awe and wonder, whatever it might be? And then you have to kind of pick out what are your value props and realize you can also blend them. So it could be that you're starting a teaching community, which you are, Scotty, right? You've got your coaching communities, that's informational, but you better believe you're going to be, you know, giving opportunities for networking. You have this close-knit family feel, sense of belonging, and you make it fun as well. So they can overlap. But again, I think mapping that out then lets you weave those things into everything. And I'm not a fan of doing things half-assed. So if you're saying, okay, I want it to be entertaining, you need to audit what you're doing. Look at your onboarding sequence. When someone signs up, have a freaking wacky, crazy video of you like letting off balloons and being like, you're here, like I appreciate you. Like weave little moments of delight like that because then you're actually putting your money where your mouth is rather than just saying, oh yeah, we're, in, we're a fun, entertaining community, but everything's dry as hell. I have a student right now finished up in the spring program, uh, Michael Chang, Strong. And he built his original following on Twitch and he hits that entertainment bucket. And so whenever he would get a new subscriber, he'd get he'd get out his shake weight and he'd do like a shake weight <laughs> celebration for new people. So like perfect example. And you know what? Moments like that, they create another really powerful thing with communities, which is inside jokes. Super, super powerful. Like if people can reference things which only a member of the group gets then it tightens that sense of belonging right up. And it's like, oh, outsiders wouldn't get it. Only we do. Like really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. Cool. So wh where do you want to go next? Or should I just keep riffing? Keep riffing. I don't know but if you've got any I know we also wanted to talk about like how to grow your community. You know, and, and mm -hmm. I'm hoping, can you parallel it real quick to someone who isn't necessarily like a business or a brand wanting to grow a community, like a design cuts or something like that. More like- yeah. Someone like me or you who we're building communities as side hustlers within our own personal brand as creatives in a sense or um, entrepreneurs, sure. whatever it is. Okay. So how to grow a community for someone like us? Someone like us. Yeah. I, I would say yeah. more people who are listening right now would be people growing something for themselves outside of a day job or they're mm -hmm. like freelancers wanting to know like, Hey, how do I create community around what I'm doing? Not just trying to attract clients. Yeah, got it. Okay. So um, again, I think the rules are actually pretty ubiquitous. 
Yeah. But not all the brands are willing to do some of the hand-to-hand combat, which I'm about to get into. And I freaking love that stuff. So I feel like four is the magic number in this book, but there's four pillars of growth for a community. There's one-to-one. There's word of mouth. There's distribution and there's inbound. And I'm going to break down those four things quickly, but it's essential to understanding them and also understanding of, the, of growth, how to grow your community, of community, get more people, more eyeballs. Cool. So I'm going to take this in like the logical order. Generally, you want to start with one-to-one. If you've got like an empty or an early stage community and you haven't got big numbers and you know the engagement's not crazy yet, you're like, okay, I need to get some eyeballs. What most people are doing is the filter dreams approach, which is build it and they will come which Hope we marketing. both know doesn't work. Hope marketing, right? Which sucks. So I'm posting and posting for months, sometimes years. Why aren't I growing? And I'm going to keep the doing the same things. thing, which is the definition of insanity, right? Keep yep. doing the same thing, expect different results. And so the best way to do it is instead of waiting for people to come to you, you go to them and you essentially go build relationships and have conversations at scale. And it's incredibly unscalable. It's incredibly manual, but it's controllable. Rather than sitting there helpless being like, how do I get people to discover me? It's like, stop waiting around. You go to them. And this is where the early foundational work. And th- there's a whole section in the book of like, define your ideal audience member, your ideal community member. When you do that, person. yeah, you're a perfect person. When you do that, it's a lot easier to figure out where they are. So it's like, where are they spending their time? What do they look like? How can you identify them? When you do the initial foundation work of there, well, then it's like, cool, I need to go find people. There they are. There's another one. There's another one. And then you just start chatting. It's not about selling. You're not saying follow for follow or any of that crap. It's like, just make friends, connect, geek out over your shared passion. And again, this goes back to the foundational stuff of like, you have to like them. You have to have that shared passion. You have to want to geek out with them. So that should be fun. Truthfully that, you know, it's a lot of work, but it should be fun. Like I love talking to hundreds of people every day about community, something I'm very passionate about. I've got a bunch of calls booked over the next couple of weeks with people I just met who are like, Hey, I'm doing this stuff over here. I'm like, cool, let's jump on a call and like share ideas. And I want to hear what you're up to. I love this stuff. That should be how it feels building your community. We do have kiddos and everything too. Like that's going to have to go away. <laughs> I used to jump on calls all the time. <laughs> now I just don't have the bandwidth to do it anymore. But yeah. it's all that stuff that compounded over time to help grow to that get community you, yeah. around it. So yeah. 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 hundred percent. And like some of the stuff I'm going to touch on, like distribution is less manual and less time intensive and highly, highly impactful. But I still... I advise people not to gloss over the one-to-one because it really matters. And, you know, like I, I know you still do this, Scotty, like you build relationships like a madman. Yeah. And one-to-one is always there, but definitely early in the beginning in the trenches, like a lot of my students are like, how do you grow an audience? I'm like, don't sit there and wait, go like little tactical things. Like when you get a new follower, go DM them and spark a conversation. When someone yeah. leaves you a comment and it's like a thoughtful comment or reply, don't fucking leave an emoji. That's lazy. <laughs> give a thoughtful response and then carry it yeah. over and give them like an audio or a video message and just blow them away with a powerful personalized experience. Like that's the one-on-one game. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, in fact, let's make it practical. I'll tell you something I'm doing right now. So I joined Community Club, which is a club for community builders because I was like, this is perfect for my new direction. Obviously, I'm trying to reach people that give a crap about community. So I joined the club. They put on a live event. So I go to the event. I watch some of the lives. I start attending. I message some of the speakers. Love your talk. I connect with them. I got some calls booked with them. On the back of all my engagement during the event, they're like, oh, we're going to invite you to a private Slack channel where we got 2,000 like really high quality individuals and community builders. I'm like, cool, I'd be on it. Thanks so much. Go in the Slack. What am I doing now? I'm replying to loads of threads. I'm being a person of value. I'm trying to help everyone I can. I'm being friendly. I'm building relationships one by one by one. So when people say, okay, cool, but how do I do this? How do I find the people? It's like, well, figure out where they are, go there and then become a person of value. Give and give and give and be nice and be a decent human being and make friends. Like it's not rocket science, but people get lost. They get overwhelmed. They get intimidated. They don't know how to do it. Like, you know, that practical example right there maps to so many niches. 
go find an existing community full of the kind of people that you want to meet facebook groups like you name it just go get involved become a bit of a face become known yeah i just looked up community club i didn't even know about this so i'll have that tucked in the show notes yeah i mean me neither but i found it recently i was like cool this resonates i'm like gonna jump website. in it's fun. Yeah, that's pretty cool right it's a designer's heaven uh heaven for sure badges everywhere <laughs> um all right so next growth hack and I'm aware of time, by the way, I prom <laughs> like speed me up whenever you need, Scotty. I just want to pack in as much as possible. So the next growth hack, word of mouth. And this is really understanding why do people share stuff? And this is at the core of why do people, you know, why are they going to recommend your community? And this is my new, <laughs> my new favorite saying, conviction kills competition. And to talk you through what I mean most people are scared to go all in on something. Scotty, you're the side hustle coach. I am now in my spare time, the community building guy. We have conviction in what we're doing and that inherently makes us more referable. It was so, scary too, though. I don't want it to make anybody right? seem like you knew how weird and nervous and fearful I was full of doubt. And some days I still deal with that, but yeah, it, it was great. It's not supposed I, to be easy. No, it's not. And guess what? Before you might have occasionally talked about side hustling, but it wasn't Strictly your whole jam. Because people would ask me questions on how to do it, you know? <laughs> right. And people don't refer people that do that. So I've seen there's a lot of people, they might write a book on community, but they wrote 20 other books. Or they do a one podcast on community, but they've got 200 other podcasts. So who's going to be like, oh yeah, they're the community guy or girl. Like they won't. It's just like part of what they're doing. They're flirting with it. They're not committed. Whereas when you're all about that thing, that's when people are like, yeah, you, oh, you want to learn about side hustles. Cool. And I've done that with you. That Literally I've done it. My where business was not flirting and going all in and owning it. That yeah. exploded everything. Yeah. You're not flirting. You're proposing. You're getting married. That's what it's all about. So um, yeah, really is quality and conviction. The two go hand in hand. We recommend stuff that is high quality and we recommend people that have conviction in, in what they're doing. And to my original quote there, conviction kills competition, is because most people aren't willing to go all in. And so you immediately make your life easier because everyone else is flirting. So when you're trying to flirt too, you're just in this crowd. When you have conviction, the numbers just fall away because no one's willing to go as deep into community as I am, or as deep into side hustling as you are. Agreed. So next up, and oh, actually, I, I do have a, a quick example of this. So, you know, your business exploded. Guess what? Two weeks into me publicly planting my flag and saying, by the way, I'm the community guy now. You know what happened? People start saying, oh yeah, Tom's the community expert. You should talk to him or you should connect with my friend great opportunity and they're in the community space too or can i book you for a coaching call because my community needs help literally everything lifted and that was from like a couple of public statements just saying i'm all about community now when you like a small flag, bit of conviction you put yourself yeah. in a position to be known for something versus known for nothing yeah or decent yeah, at basically. a lot of things but you're never top of mind i'd rather be top of mind Mm -hmm. And again, that's something which is relatively low work, but can be incredibly high impact and especially can compound over time. So I love the, you know, hand to hand combat stuff. We touched on with that one to one word of mouth, position yourself, right. And it's going to compound and help you grow way into the future. The next piece is distribution. This is one of my favorites. And to give you an example, my friend, I did a guest newsletter for her and I provided a bunch of value at the end. I, I was like, oh, by the way, check out my guide. I got a thousand newsletter subscribers from that one guest newsletter. Insane, right? And it took me a few hours to write. Can you imagine how long it would have taken me to attract a thousand people, one person at a time? A freaking bunch. So distribution is powerful and it's very, very overlooked. One of my, uh, my friends and coaching students, Tama, he was kind of flirting with distribution. And then I said to him, like, you're not doing this enough. Block off one week every single month where you basically like don't do other work. You put a freaking out of office on your email inbox and you just reach out to people and try and get on podcasts, get on webinars, et cetera, et cetera. Outreach. And his, his outreach, his brand has taken off. Like it's really starting to find momentum and he's popping up everywhere as the expert in his niche, which is black letter calligraphy. 
He was on the Happy Ever Crafter with Becca. Like he, he's appearing everywhere and it's really starting to grow at an exponentially faster rate than it was before when he was kind of dabbling in it. So again, distribution matters. And there's a, a bunch of nuance in how to do this. So I'm going to break this down real fast. Looking at an audience to get in front of, they need to have an incredible amount of relevance and they need to be very active. And again, people normally gloss over these things. So relevance to your fitness example, Scotty, let's imagine that you were, um, I don't know, doing like CrossFit. I don't know if you hate CrossFit or love it. My body can't handle that these days. I got an old man right. back from blowing it out in football. <laughs> All right. Let's say, let's say powerlifting then. Okay. I'm down with some of that still. Yeah. Cool. So powerlifting. If you went and got in front of a community that just said general fitness community, and you were like, I'm going to do a distribution effort. I'm going to like do a guest blog for them or like a webinar or whatever it might be. It might be that only 5% of that audience are powerlifters. The rest, you've got people doing Zumba, Pilates, yoga, Jazzercise. bodybuilding. Yeah, <laughs> Jazzercise. <laughs> like all of that stuff, right? And so you're going to convert pretty poorly. But if you went and did the same exact strategy in a powerlifting community, you can be sure that 100% of that audience are going to be into what you're doing. So again, most people skip over this and don't think about it, but it's like, go super, super relevant. This the is, next thing is- This is oh, like, ahead, I just want to be vulnerable. That's probably like the hardest thing for me is distribution from the self-promo or asking for people because I get hit up all the time with such gross outreach that I'm just like, I don't ever want to be that person. So like me asking to be on someone's podcast or something, that makes me really uncomfortable. Even yeah. though I feel like I could do it from a total different direction of providing value. I just get hit up with such gross outreach all the time that it just like hurts outreach for me of wanting to do it for others. So that is something I need to go and uh, dive deep on within your book. Well, let's break it down. I'm on this podcast right now. This is distribution because this brings brand awareness and awareness for my free book. Why and how did I get on this podcast? Because I asked you to be. You didn't even ask for this. Why did you ask me? Because we're buddies and I believe in you and I want to invest in you and I know it can provide value to my audience. That's it. Relationship, mm -hmm. quality, value, conviction, everything we're talking about. So it's not about going and spamming everyone. It's like putting in the legwork. And understanding the rejection or mm. everything that comes with it. It's just, man, I just don't ever want to feel gross. But I think, I feel like I could master the way of cold outreach in a very um, productive value positioned way. I think honestly, yeah. it's more just based out of fear for sure. And just telling myself I don't have the time, but really it's like the fear it, of it's fear. someone being like, dude, Scotty Russell just pitched himself in such a gross way. Like, I can't believe he would do that. Because some of the times I'm like, I can't believe this person like just pitched themselves this what way I, to me. You wouldn't do it in a gross way. But I think you're almost giving yourself too credit, too much credit rather, without being offensive. Like we we worry like, oh, they're going to like hate me. It's I'm like, they're not going to care that much. People pleaser. So yeah, yeah, no, me, me too. I get it. Me too, me too. Um, but people don't care. Like the worst thing that's going to happen is they're just ignore it. In no one's going to be like, I need no, to go trash that asked. guy. Yeah, like, like no one's going to go trash you for asking to be on their podcast. Right. That's like the worst that, yeah. Yeah. So that's like a vulnerable thing for me as I recover from people pleasing. That's like the distribution thing is really, really hard for me. That's an area. Yeah. Even my own coach has been like, yo, you need to like do this more. So it's funny, uh, timely that you said it. So yeah. Yeah. I'm, please uh, please so, continue. I don't want to hijack it. No, no, it's good, man. Like I, I so to break this down, right. I... I just wrote the book. I'm now batch writing four months worth of content. And then I'm passing that over to my designer and my assistant to go schedule it from now until like September, which gives me four months to do nothing but distribution with my personal brand. Literally, I'm going underground for four months now to connect with everyone I can and go talk everywhere I can and shout about community. That's how much I believe in distribution. Four months of my life is going into this. So earlier, I'm in that community club. Someone announces, oh, my podcast is on Product Hunt. It's a podcast all about community. And I just message them. I'm like, oh, looks amazing. Are you accepting guests? And they're like, yeah, we are. What have you done? And I tell them, they're like, cool. Let's have you on. I'll talk to you next week. We'll organize it. Boom, done. Like that, that's not sleazy. Like, you know, they have a need. 
are you looking for guests? Yes, we are. They have a need. I'm helping them and they're helping me. I just, I realize this is an, a weakness that will help me take the next step. So very, very timely stuff. And I know we are approaching. So I want to make sure you have time to finish up distribution as well as get into inbound. And then we can land the plane and give people solid call to action if they want more. Cool. Can I go unbelievably speedily? Because I wanted to make sure we discuss stuff, but I want to yeah. talk about nurturing if possible as well. Yeah. But I want to be respectful of your time, man. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So distribution, you basically, you want to look for the super relevant communities. You want to make sure they're active. You can tell, go through the comments. Are they getting comments? Are they spammy emojis? Or are they like diehard fans that are supporting everything they do? I mentioned Christo earlier. Wherever that guy shows up, like 500 people show up. Doesn't matter which platform. That's a great indicator that they have an active audience. Look for people like that, that have fans rather than just spammy empty followers because you will get a thousand times the results. I think I've talked before on the show about vanity metrics. Example in the book, did a partnership with an audience of a million people. We did a partnership with an audience of 5,000 people. The one with 5,000, 20x the results of the one with a million. So don't just go chasing you know, distribution with people that have big audiences. Often it's hollow as hell. Go look for those like super relevant, super active, even Engaged you know much smaller. Days. Yeah, and if it's super small, it doesn't matter relevance and activity that's what you're looking for so then go pitch them get in front of them and very crucially have a call to action let's make this kind of meta you shouted my book out today that is a specific call to action you're not just getting there for pure brand awareness try and have a way to bring them back into your home and i I know you do the same thing you've got all kinds of cool like free guides and stuff right and here's a little paradigm shift scotty because i really want to push you on the distribution this year Realize that by doing it, you're getting in front of the most engaged people in their audience. Because how many people total in your audience, including all the social followers? Not counting podcast downloads, like just total. Like every, everything. Like, I yeah. 50, 60. K. Yeah. 50, 60 K. I guarantee you're not getting 50, 60 K who are listening to us right now. No. But whatever that smaller number is, and I know it's still, you know, a really decent number they have naturally filtered themselves down to be the most engaged people in your community. It's not the people on Instagram that like have your mute or whatever. Neither of us will get anything from them. But right now, whoever, you know, has me and Scotty in your ear holes, like you're an awesome engaged person in Scotty's community. And so through your distribution efforts, you're naturally going to be reaching the best quality people and the most awesome people that you're actually looking to reach. Cool. So, Inbound is basically why the rich get richer. Think about it. The big communities always grow faster than when you're starting out because of social proof, credibility, et cetera. It's really hard and it's a momentum game. So realize that it will compound as you keep plugging away, building your community, you'll feel it start to speed up as you build it and build it and build it. You can also do very intentional things. So for example, at my company Design Cuts, we were like, oh, a ton of people are into Procreate. Um, And we figured out what kind of audiences do we want to get in front of? We're like, well, Procreate communities. Rather than just relying on partnerships and distribution, we went and started a Procreate Facebook group called the Procreate Creative Community. That's got nearly 10,000 members now. It's growing super rapidly. One of the, yeah, quick, one of the biggest in the world. And every single day, people are searching Procreate on Facebook, joining the group and discovering us through osmosis. And we're doing like outside of running it, like we're not doing any active effort for those people to find us. We just set up something that attracts inbound interest. All right, nurturing. This is big. So Scotty, how about I rapid fire machine gun this? And then you stop me at... (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> love it and then you stop me at any point if you're like go deeper on that sound good cool so first of all there's two sections to how to nurture your community and create true fans there is the highly unscalable way and then there, there's the more scalable way i believe you should be using both starting with unscalable there is magic in the unscalable I really, really believe that all the unscalable stuff we do for our audience where they're so like wowed and taken aback, like I freaking live for that stuff. So first of all, respond to everyone. It's a no brainer. A lot of people aren't doing it. How do you feel when someone leaves you on red or leaves you ignored or doesn't respond to your comment? It sucks, right? It's so powerful just to get back to everyone. I was off social media three months. 
came back on this week. I responded to over a thousand people that had built up while I was off social media. There were people from February where I was like, didn't forget about you. And they're like, oh my God, I can't believe you got back to me. It matters. So one community mindset. Think about this, Scotty. If you had one student, single person in your community, they were paying all your bills, putting food on the table for your family, showing up, leaving comments, the only person doing that, you would treat them like gold dust, right? I would overserve. Overserve. You would do everything you can. You know every, all their wants and needs. Like they'd be your best freaking friend. Try and extend that mindset to as many of your core community as you can for as long as you can. It really matters that one community mindset. Value magnitude. In the early days, especially, you have no leverage. No one gives a crap about you. I give the example in the book if The Rock likes my photo on Instagram, I'm taking a screenshot, framing that in my house. I'm telling all my friends. It would like make my life, right? Because I'm a big fanboy of The Rock. It takes him two seconds because he has all the leverage. You have to flip that mindset. When you start out, you have dick leverage. That, t- that sounds terrible. <laughs> dick leverage. Dick leverage. You got, you got dick leverage. <laughs> oh, there's so many things oh, I just want to like throw on on tangents, the, but that would be the, unprofessional. The, there goes the podcast artwork anyway. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. I've never said that in my life. Don't know where that came from. Please. So <laughs> on top of the dick leverage. <laughs> Oh man, I'm gone. So, (laughs) (laughs) all right. So value magnitude, I'll give you an example. You need to give back value an order of magnitude greater than what your community give you, because that's going to be one of the only ways they're going to continue to stick around in the early days when everyone else is pulling at their attention. You have to overserve. In the early days, I had seven people who regularly showed up on my comments and supported me before anyone else did. What I did was I responded to their stuff. I friended them. I DM them. I built genuine friendships. I invited them to a weekly private uh, coaching group and I gave them coaching, bearing in mind my hourly rates, like quite expensive, every single week for seven months in exchange for them liking a few Instagram posts and leaving some comments. Inarguably, that is a ridiculous value exchange. But on the back of it, that was the start of it all. They told their friends, they showed up, they became true fans. They sung about me from the rooftops. And when people ask me, how do you have such an engaged community? It's moments like that. Can you continue that forever? No. Should you do some of that stuff at the start? Hell yeah. And there's so many examples like Becca Class, and there's a great case study in the book. When she started Show Me Your Drills, which had 65,000 students enrolled last term. Yeah, Becca Cortez. Have you ever cracked her? Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Just making sure not food letter, yeah, yeah, yeah. calligraphy. <laughs> so she had 65,000 students earlier this year in the last semester. When she started it in, I think, 2015, 2016, 20. With those 20, she showed up. She jumped on calls with them. She gave free value and consultancy. She wrote them letters and sent it to them in the mail. She did all of this stuff. And it was super interesting. I thought I was the only one crazy enough to do this stuff. But when I started interviewing highly successful people, they're like, I did that in year one too. And I'm like, damn, there's a Powerful pattern here. Powerful personalized experiences is what I like to call Yes. It. And no one's talking about it, right? Most successful people, they don't talk about what they did eight years ago when they were doing this crazy manual stuff. But when you really drill down to it, a lot of them have done it, which makes me happy. Yeah. Um, And so this, yeah, this goes to my next point, which is personalizing delight. Gymshark in the book, Black Friday went wrong, all kinds of technical issues. Ben Francis, the founder, he sat and wrote over a thousand handwritten apology notes and shipped it out to customers. They've invited people to their office and given them like crazy experiences, meeting the whole team. You're trying to wow and delight people blow them away, make their day, make their year, create those moments. It's so important always, but especially at the start to get that momentum going. Um, you know, and true fans, this is something we've talked about on this show before, I think. This is how you do it. You need to just freaking delight people and, and over-serve them. Um, as you scale, you need to think about filtering your fans. So it's all well and good, like making friends with everyone and doing that at scale. It's hard to do when you've got 100,000 people. So to do that, you need to look for indicators of fanship which is generally engagement, them following you across various platforms, showing up in the comments, chatting to you, shouting you out, sharing you. Get those people and disproportionately allocate your time and do all the crazy magic, unscalable 80, stuff with them. 80-20. Although it's more like one ninety nine, to be honest. 
Yeah. Right. So you get that core, like 1%, 10%, whatever it might be. And then you do the crazy hands-on stuff with them. And then you do the scalable stuff for the 90%. And just to run, have I got time to run through the scalable stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got like five more minutes. All right. So a few ways very quickly to scale your community efforts. Being authentic, such a buzzword. Again, I break down in the book exactly how to do that. Show all sides of yourself, not just the highlight. We're on the best side. Be real. Uh, I talk about macro branding and micro branding. Micro branding is like the idiosyncrasies we all know about. So with, you know, The Rock, my favorite guy, obviously. I know so much random stuff about like his snack mills and his banter with Kevin Hart and the cool stuff that he does for his crew that draws me to him more than the fact that he's a movie star, which is like what he's known for. The more you open up and share these moments, like I jump on and play the piano in my Instagram story. I get 12 people message me. Oh, I love the the piano too. And you could do that in a raw format, like on your stories. Yeah. Show more of you and show all sides of you and show the, the idiosyncrasies you think don't matter because I guarantee they will be an in for someone to connect with you on that level. Your weird so quirks. Share them. Yeah, like the more you share, the more opportunity you you basically have for to connections. build a connection with someone for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, go live. You know, that's a great way or, you know, indeed record content like this. You're scalably helping people through this podcast. Um, answer one, answer many. So if you've got questions coming in, obviously address it in a public domain and help tons of people. Elect leaders and mods. So if you've got incredible people in your community who are naturally being helpful, then empower them, give them a status and, and you know guide them with how to do that. Or if you need higher help, there's been people I've coached recently who could not keep up with it all. They hired help and it was a game changer for them. Uh, scale your vision. Great case study in the book with the future. When they slapped a big 1 billion, help a billion people mission and be one of the 1 billion minus one, it went through the roof with the engagement and people resonating with their mission and signing up. Um, people buy into mission. A lot of communities are kind of vision led um, and it's so important. And again, I kind of break down how, how that works, build with them, get their feedback, validate features and ideas, no matter how random we let people choose stuff all the time at my company. It could be something random, like pick our new logo or profile picture, or it could be like, do you want a, a course on this or should we move into this vertical or whatever it might be? Just make them feel like they have a say and their say matters. Listen to them. Um, and then there's a few more points, but I'm going to jump to the last one. It's one of my favorites. Give them a name. It's so powerful, right? Give a collective name for your community or your individual community members. And there's a few examples I cite, but basically a clever play on words can be highly effective. And then one that represents the vibe of your brand and your energy. So think early day Gary V, Vaniacs, which Vayner is Nation. cool because it's a, yeah, Vayner Nation later on. So, you know, Vaniacs in particular plays to his high energy persona. You're a maniac, you're a Vaniac, but it's a clever play on name. You've got uh, Huel, which is like a energy supplement for fitness um, fitness people. They call their uh, tribe the Hooligans, which is super smart. You've got a, a UK rapper, Steflon Don. She talks about the Don. She's like, I appreciate all my Dons. That creates a sense of belonging because it's like a badge of honor. PC here, man. Like, truly exactly. part of the family. PC fam, right? And I know I'm showing I a lot of love to them. <laughs> but I like it and it still works. And so that creates a sense of belonging. I wear it like a badge of honor. I am part of this tribe, part of this community. There is so much more I could get into, but for now, I say we I do hope, an Instagram live valuable. in the meantime while this goes out and let's dive a little bit deeper. Yeah, so. man, it's, it's, it's hard to pack it all in, to be honest, but I, I, I hope that was helpful. Oh as a man, this is community. insane. So where can people go to download this? I'll also have it in the show notes, but just someone listening on the fly. Where can people go to download this in this as well as support you? Uh, so my new website is tomross.co, so .co, uh, and you can find it there. Or if you go direct to it, it's at communitymanual.com. Um, and I just hope it helps a ton of people, to be honest. I want this to be like the go-to practical guide for building an engaged community of people that actually give a crap yeah and this is something i'm really passionate about too and it's just nice because to me growing an engaged community around your work is just one little layer of building a creative side hustle you know it's just part of it mindset marketing motivation community building so it's a pleasure to get a chance to just like spotlight you and melt people's faces with all this value because i know this is what people are looking for at the end of the day, it's like, dude, you got to show up and do the work. 
if you really, really <laughs> yeah, want it. You certainly do. Yeah, then yeah. it takes and It's time. real work. But if you it's love nurturing. it, like who wouldn't love talking about something they're passionate about all day and meeting awesome like-minded people who support them and care about them and make a living off of that? What's better than that? It's the best feeling in the world. 100%. Well, Tommy boy, let's stay connected. And it's just a pleasure. You're a regular, you're, you're podcast family here. You're part of the PC fam. Um, Thank you, mate. We will keep in Appreciate touch you. and yeah, I can't wait to have people download this book, you know? So when you download it, make sure you tag him and uh, I'll give you all the call to actions in the intros and the outros. So much love to you, brother. It's a pleasure seeing you today. Mate, I, I love the show. Thank you for having me back on. I appreciate you. Always brother. Peace. Thanks again for listening. It'd be awesome if you took the time to subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and let the comment below so we can connect. Again, if you want to catch a shout out as a future listener of the week, make sure you subscribe to the show on iTunes and give it a rating and review.